Okay, um, hello everyone. So um, I'm Alon Cholev, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Vast Data, uh, what this company does, uh, and why, and uh, how how are we involved with uh, with Agoda. So Vast is seven years old. Um, we have about 200 employees in Israel. It's mostly engineering and support. Uh, 200 additional employees worldwide, mostly operations and sales, a uh, relatively big office in the US, uh, another office in, in London, um, and many distributed smaller offices around the globe. I do architecture, product management, um, and I also personally manage the, the Agoda POC. The, the early interactions were um, uh, Agoda was testing uh, the vast storage platform. Um, early on, we even had some issues. And, and given that we had a great team to work with uh, at Agoda um, and great engineers here in the company, we managed to overcome them pretty quickly and get that system into production. So as I said, we're gonna talk about um, why we built the company, uh, why we built this product. Um, we're gonna talk about how it works. Um, and I'm also gonna dig into um, an industry shift going from file to object, this shift, um, uh, Goda is uh, one of the, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say a pioneer uh, because, you know, object storage has been around for a while, but um, we did see from, from the side working with this company um, how, uh, how quickly um, this entire shift uh, happened within Agoda as well. Um, so the motivation seven years ago started with us uh, kind of identifying the data explosion um, that started many years ago, but it's not really stopping. Uh, today at 2022, uh, we see around 100 zettabytes of data in the world. The zettabyte is 1,000 exabytes, uh, and an exabyte is 1,000 petabytes. And this data is, you know, it's diff many different types of data, and this data is stored in many different places. Um, but you could really see different organizations being able to collect more data, to analyze it, to extract more value from data. Um, and we see it in, in so many different verticals. We see it in um, um, life sciences, like genome data. Suddenly, you, you have entire uh, countries wanting to, um, to, to be able to collect and analyze genome across large populations uh, for, for you know, national health purposes, uh, medical companies, that are um, uh, collecting a lot of information from trials, X-ray, MRIs, the resolution of this medical imagery keeps going up. Uh, we see cameras and cars. Every Tesla car has eight cameras on it. Uh, and all, that, all of that information uh, takes storage. So storage keeps growing. Um, and, and what's more interesting is that the access to that storage uh, is, is needed more than it was before. Um, what we, what we saw in the industry is this pyramid where there's different tiers of storage. There's the archival storage, which is let's collect that data, but we, we, we're not necessarily ever gonna need to read it. Let's just store it just in case. There's backup data, which is again, only if something gets lost, we need to, to, to go and read that data. There is hybrid storage, which is scalable can store more information, but it, it's not necessarily the fastest. Uh, hybrid storage could be a system that has hard drives and SSDs, maybe a mix of these two. And then there's all flash systems uh, at the tip of the pyramid, which are very fast, um, but are also uh, pretty expensive and therefore they're smaller at scale and they can't cover the, the entirety of the organization's data uh, very often. Um, and, and the realization is that machine learning and, a, and AI loves lots of data. Uh, it, it, it loves lots of uh, you know, low latency. Um, organizations want to, to get that data scientist to be free, uh, to roam and just analyze data and work with it without conflicting with each other, without asking for the data to come uh, to arrive from archive. Um, and we wanted to build something that has uh, just less tiers, because when, once there is less tiering, there is just one platform that can serve everyone, and the storage experience is much, is much simpler. Um, so, so let's identify exactly what we want to build. We, build, we want to build a universal data platform. We want it to be high performance. That means all flash. NVMe um, is, is a, a relatively modern protocol that defines how to interact with an SSD. 
Um, it replaced SCSI, which was more uh, relevant in the uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, so today, when you buy a modern SSD, odds are it's going to be NVMe. We wanted to reach very high scale, exabyte scale, um, while battling the cost, keeping the cost down. And we wanted to build an enterprise NAS and object storage. We wanted to go with you know, industry standards to make it very simple uh, for customers to adopt the product. Um, here's some of the building blocks that we had exactly seven years ago. So we were lucky enough to be in a time and place where there were new technologies out there that made it possible to build a new type of storage architecture. Uh, and many of the existing storage products out there, they will build differently with different building blocks and they couldn't really adopt the things that you see here. So what are those? Um, NVMe over fabrics. NVMe over fabrics basically lets a cluster of servers, a bunch of machines, talk to each other, right? But only, but also read from each other's hard drives or SSDs. So basically one server can read from another server's SSD with very low latency. Um, today, we even have hardware that, that implements that, that the network interface card can actually serve reads and writes from uh, an SSD. Um, we, we support um, a relatively low cost flash, QLC flash. Um, and, and, and the trade-off with, with flash drives is that the, the denser the flash drive is, we use 15 terabytes or 30 terabyte drives. The denser the flash drive is, it has lower endurance. It can accept less writes. Um, and if you, if you architect for that, you can actually work around it and, and increase the, the lifespan of, of these drives. Um, the last component is storage class memory. Storage class memory is basically just a very, very fast SSD. And we use those SSDs for uh, metadata and, and, and as a write buffer, accepting the user's data very, very fast and manipulating that in the background uh, for doing things like compression and protecting the data. <clears throat> so let's see how the architecture looks like. Um, so we have basically three layers. The, the, the uppermost layer is the protocol layer where there is clients communicating with the storage platform. It could be using NFS, which is the file protocol for Linux, SMB, which is the file protocol for Windows and Macs, uh, S3 object storage, and we also have a plugin for Kubernetes. In one layer below that, there is many, many, we call them vast containers, but it's actually standard servers running, running Docker containers with our software. Um, and the clients simply are distributed across these containers. So you could, you could have a vast cluster that has, say, 80 of these containers all serving traffic, and they can all serve all the traffic. They can all provide access to the same objects, to the same files. And that's because all of these containers are connected to all the flash of the cluster, all the drives. The, all the drives are distributed to enclosures. Each one of these enclosures has 56 drives in it. And you can just add more enclosures to add more capacity. And you can add more vast containers to get more performance. Each one of these AJ enclosures, uh, AJ stands for high availability. Uh, within a vast cluster, you can't have a single point of failure. So each one of these comp components should be able to fail. You can fail a server, you can fail one of these containers. Um, within those highly available enclosures that have lots of flash, we also have two servers inside, two controllers to be able to protect um, and, and really expose the, the flash on these enclosures in case one of them fails. Within this architecture, we have, when it comes to the software, we have the protocol layer where we have the, the, the servers for NFS, the NFS server, the SMB server, S3 server, um, and, and more protocols coming in the future. And, and a layer below that, we have what we call the element store. The element store is really the implementation of a file system. How a directory looks like when you have a million names in it. How does a file look like when it has many different extents, many different regions that were written to? Uh, how do link different links, symbolic links and hard links look like? Um, ACLs for managing permissions, encryption keys. Um, how do we manage snapshots to be able to recover uh, deleted files or previous versions of files? or versions of objects because S3 has versions based on an object where file systems have snapshot for the entire um, file system. So we have this metadata layer with many data structures that would be familiar for everyone that worked with um, a file system. A layer below that takes care of storing the actual data. 
the file data gets broken into many different pieces and we reduce those things we apply compression techniques we protect this data in case of in case the drive fails we have parity and protection for that data to make sure we can recover it and rebuild it um, and that layer is also in charge of the encryption itself so let's dig a little bit into into the data store this is one of the the interesting areas at vast where we have you know a large engineer engineering team and, and they they did a lot of innovation and a lot of algorithms and i would say you know eventually vast is a software company you would see an appliance a large you know appliance in your data center but vast is really a software company we work with these standard components um, um, coming from from very large vendors like nvidia and intel and melanox um, but eventually we are a software company and we do the innovation in software with a lot of these algorithms and data structures so the the number one goal of these all these algorithms is really you know we're starting with flash so we're gonna we're gonna provide good performance and now the algorithms are there for uh, making up for the cost right flash is about between four and ten times more expensive than a hard drive it depends on the type of flash um, and in order to reduce this gap there's a bunch of things we want to do so the first thing we we, we did is increase the lifespan of these ssds we we write to these low endurance ssds in very large blocks, we take whatever the user is doing, it could be very small operations, and we collect them together um, and, and write large blocks to increase the lifespan of these uh, QLC SSDs. Uh, sometimes this year we expect, next year we expect PLC SSDs, the next generation of high capacity SSDs to come out. They could be could, could, could even be 40 terabytes or 60 terabyte drives. Um, the next thing is how do you protect the data? Data protection is about What's happening when a drive goes down, when the entire server goes down? Uh, how do you recover and rebuild that data? In earlier generations of HDFS, for example, the Hadoop file system, um, they just used triplication, which is storing three copies of the data, right? Three copies means two third, six to six point six percent overhead, right? In in uh, in, in newer versions of HDFS, Erasure Code was introduced, which is now the industry standard. The erasure code with VAST has an overhead of only 2.7%, which is extremely, extremely low. Um, the third thing we do when we talk about cost and how do we, how do we keep it low um, is that we apply data reduction to the data. Data reduction is a combination of compression and deduplication, a bunch of mechanisms that I'm going to talk about. Let's start with erasure coding. Um, so whatever, whenever data comes into the system, say you ingest data um, uh, using S3 or NFS, that data is going to land in the storage class memory, in the very fast SSD that can accept many small operations with low latency. We have a bunch of those for every, um, uh, uh, given the, the, the capacity in the vast cluster, 99% of the capacity is the QLC flash, 1% is that storage class memory, the very fast SSD, and that's enough for us to buffer incoming data uh, and handle it. And once we collect this data, for uh, we take these lar large chunks, we calculate the parity, and the example you see on the screen has 36 data blocks and four blocks of parity, right? So we calculate these four blocks of parity using some math. Um, you can look, if, if you wanna see examples online, a very common uh, erasure code is Reed Solomon, and you can look that up. We use something um, that's a bit different. And we store all these data blocks along with the parity blocks on different SSDs. So let's, uh, let's assume one of those SSDs failed and we lost block 31. The way to, to um, uh, recover that data is that we need to read a bunch of these existing data blocks and parity, this row down here, and the parity and we can recover this lost block. The next thing is similarity. So similarity compression is something new that, that we thought very hard on. We, we um, intuitively, when you see different types of data, right? sometimes data is very similar. If you're gonna be uh, collecting information from the same sensor, um, um, it's going to be very similar, different sample from the same sensor, say it's a temperature sensor. So the temperature doesn't change every minute, even though you're going to want to monitor it every minute. Um, but every sample has a different timestamp and those timestamps change. So when we, when we look at 
uh, data coming from the financial markets, data coming from databases. We saw a lot of the data is similar, not exactly the same. And we and and, and then storage systems have a hard time finding um, uh, duplicate blocks uh, and, and and storing less data. So similarity compression is about taking the incoming data and clustering it to similar blocks. So after we 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 apply some math on on the incoming data, we use hash functions uh, that help us identify similar blocks. We group them together. So all the blue blocks are together and the green blocks are together um, and we compress them together and basically what happens is that we only store the delta right what you see on the right hand side is that we store this block came first and then the, the the block after that we only had to store the difference between them right so this is very efficient and, and results in storing less data on flash which is the most expensive component so data reduction is, is as we as we call it is basically three different mechanisms. Compression, which you know today, uh, we have customers that apply things like you know GZIP and Snappy and different compression algorithms. We also apply compression to the data. Uh, we use Z standard, which is considered today uh, the best compression engine out there. Um, we do deduplication, which is you know as the file or object goes into the VAS cluster and it's broken into blocks, say even as small as 32k blocks. We find the identical blocks, and if we found one, we're not going to store it on Flash. We're just going to store a bit, a bit of metadata saying that block already exists. And the third thing is similarity reduction, um, which we just uh, just talked about. So compression is working within a block. Would compress it to find within a 32k block, find uh, similar data. Deduplica deduplication would work across different blocks, and similarity is is somewhat a combination of these. Uh, two different mechanisms. Um, and, and just to give you an example, Agoda stores 15 petabytes of data on 10 petabytes of flash. And that's even after the majority of the data uh, is already compressed. Okay, which means there's, you know, duplication of data, similar types, similar, similar files that are compressing uh, the same. And eventually, um, this standard compression can even get a bit more on top of existing compression algorithms. So let's dig a little bit into the, the architecture and how things work. Um, we have a client and it wants to connect to a cluster. And we said the cluster has vast containers where we call them C nodes, uh, compute nodes uh, usually. And we have the AJ enclosures. And now we can see that each one has two D nodes, data nodes. It has storage class memory, which is the fastest SSDs. Uh, and we have the hyperscale flash, the QLC flash. Um, all the C nodes connect to all the D nodes. Every one of the C nodes can serve reads and writes to the entirety of the data. Um, and, and one of these, and every client that connects to the system is going to land on one of those C nodes. So we would use things like DNS round robin, DNS delegation to have the client just use a nice name like you know, vast.agata.com uh, as a URL for, for uh, the S3 operations. And he would get a different IP every time and, and, would, and would land on a different C node. Um, let's look at what happens when a, when a client writes data. So the client would send, say, a put operation to upload an object. It would communicate with one of the C nodes. And the C node would direct the data to two different uh, D nodes to two different SEM drives. Uh, that way, if it's near, there is no single point of failure, if one of the drives fail, we have a copy on another drive. And that data lasts on, on those drives for a relatively short period of time because it's going to be migrated to flash uh, with an erasure code. So the data on SCM has a 50% overhead. We preserve two copies there for a short period of time. Um, but it gives the client a great experience because he's, he's writing for to a very fast SSD. And all the algorithms that we just described is not waiting for them. This data, you know, it, 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 it's added with the CRC to make sure there's no bit flips or anything. Um, but it lands directly on uh, SCM. Now, the migration part is when we have this background pipeline where data gets processed. And, and the background pipeline contains many different steps. So for every data that came into the system, we're going to do dedupe, we're going to apply similarity, compression, erasure code encryption. It's a pipeline of operations that are all happening uh, in the background. Um, 
I, I forgot to mention that before the data goes through all these processes, it, it, can, on, it can also be replicated to another cluster. But also has a data reco uh, uh, disaster recovery um, uh, cluster um, that, that protects, you know, whatever pieces of data that uh, Agoda deemed uh, important uh, to have a backup for. Um, uh, Alan, I have a question. Yeah. So when the client sends the data to uh, the system, the system acknowledges the right and does all this eraser coding in the background. Yes, so it acknowledges the right when the data is persistent on two SSDs, like you see it here. Um, and it was very important for us in, in, in this architecture to make sure that we don't rely on RAM. We don't rely on memory. I had a personal experience working for another storage company where um, that company lost data several times just because the data was 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 act yeah. after 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 going into RAM, and that was because uh, uh, that architecture was, run, was relying on UPSs and, and batteries and mechanisms that are are never a hundred percent reliable, right? They they you 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 rely upon someone connecting the cables correctly and having redundancy and power in the rack, and those things are never a hundred percent in our control. So we wanted to, to, to make something simple and it's also cheaper because having RAM with capacitors like RAM with batteries uh, where the, that which is possible or having UPS, those things are pretty expensive. Um, and using those fast SSDs, we can return an act to the client pretty fast um, while having the data being persistent. So there's never data that is, let's call it uh, at risk or dirty in memory in the vast cluster uh, that the client needs to, to worry about. Okay. Thanks. Now, one of the nice things about this architecture is that the, the, these background operations happening um, without even the client noticing, which are in charge of really storing the data in the most efficient way, they eliminate the trade-off. We don't slow the client down because we apply compression. We don't slow it down because we want to do dedupe and find you know, duplicate chunks. Um, and another, another, another very significant effect um, of NVMe over fabrics, which lets all these C nodes communicate with all the D nodes and see all these flash drives, is that we distribute the work across the entire cluster. So, you know, we see when we see data pipelines, it would be very often that would, you, you would have a few servers write a lot of data and you'll have a ton of servers reading data. And, and what's, what's nice here is that these, these few clients ingesting data, writing data to the system, could be using a few C nodes, but all the C nodes would be participating in the tasks of dedupe similarity compression, because each one of those C nodes would take a different chunk of data that landed on SCM, on storage class memory, and would migrate it to flash. So it's very scalable in a sense. And, and, and this is why when you increase the size of a vast cluster, all the C nodes participate in all the different types of tasks of the cluster. Let's say a drive fails, all the C nodes participate in rebuilding that data and, and storing it on different drives. So if you double the number of C nodes on the cluster, the rebuild times go down by half. So it's pretty cool. The read path is pretty simple and it's it's very much optimized for you know analytics, uh, which, which means we want to be reading very fast with low latency. Um, the client goes to a C node, the C node has some metadata to know what data lies where, and it simply reads directly from, um, from, the, from Flash through the D nodes. Now, it's important to say the NVMe over fabrics that we described earlier um, does not sound revolutionary because it's, it's basically connecting two things that already exist, being able to communicate on the network and reading from an SSD. Um, but again, what's nice about it is that A, it uses uh, RDMA, which is very, very fast. Uh, it's not easy to use RDMA in every data center. It requires a relatively modern network. Uh, it needs to be to have good quality of service. It needs to be lossless. It needs to not drop packets. Um, and, and we have an internal network for the cluster that can serve RDMA. And that gets the C nodes very low latency reading from flash. Um, and, and the other part is that once that task was very well defined, that protocol, um, hardware vendors uh, started to, to actually implement it in the network interface card. So VAST is coming out this December with a new enclosure that no longer has Intel CPUs. We have a network interface card that can read from, from 
from Flash. So these D nodes are really going to be, be just a very smart network interface card. It does have an ARM core, but no data is going to flow through that. OK, so enough about the architecture. Let's talk about the transition to object. Um, so from, from an industry standpoint, uh, the, the big transition to S3 and object is really coming from the cloud. And the reason for that is that S3 is, is the most, is the only really viable storage solution in the cloud. Everything is relatively expensive. And S3 provides you know, different tiers where some of those tiers are just sane enough cost-wise to be able to, to store vast amounts of data. Uh, when you look at file systems in the cloud, when you look at um, um, EBS, you know, the, the solution for block devices in the cloud, those are very, very expensive, um, extremely expensive when comparing the, the, to the total cost of ownership for, to a vast cluster. Um, and, and, and given that storage, storage option being the only good option, you know, the analytics community uh, followed and ported applications to be able to run on S3, uh, leaving things behind, leaving HDFS behind, leaving a lot of different uh, options behind. Um, and, and this is where a lot of innovation has happened. Now, I also see S3 as, as a somewhat of an evolution. Uh, you know, Amazon uh, built a new protocol. They had an opportunity to fix some shortcomings of file protocols. Um, so from an administration perspective, there's lifecycle policies, being able to say, let's delete all data automatically. There's identity policies. Let's not use ACLs on a per file basis. Let's just have a policy saying, all the users of the development group can access the, these buckets, right? It's very easy to manage access on a bucket level, uh, on a user or group level, and not needing to, to have um, ACLs on every specific object. In the older file systems, we see customers sometimes needing to traverse a tree of a billion files, changing permissions in every one, every single one of them. When you have a hundred billion files, it, it's getting very hard to understand who can access which one of those files. But working with policies means that the, that the entire organization can have a handful of these policies uh, and really control access in, in a very transparent uh, and easy way. Um, and another reason we like it for the world of analytics is that Usually, the, the the entity that ingests data, right, coming from you know uh, a Kafka pipeline, for example, would not necessarily know at that point in time who needs to access that data. So it's really nice to have that application just write the data, not care about permissions, and have administrations, administrators, and other entities in the organization being able to control who can access it again without touching every single object. Um, another nice feature is bucket versioning, where uh, where as part of the protocol, it talks about how to protect the data in case uh, it gets deleted or in case multiple versions need to be stored. Um, file systems also have uh, snapshots. It's, ne it's never a part of the standard itself. It's not a part of NFS, it's not a part of SMB. Vendors usually just present virtual directories like a dot snapshots directory where you can access previous uh, versions of the data. Um, the last thing I would mention about S3 is metadata. There's, um, you know, alongside the data, you can attach metadata. And, and VAS is really excited about this type of metadata because um, I'm going to talk about it a bit later. We're also building a database. So once we see this data along with its metadata, we are thinking about how to make this queryable, how to be able to find objects based on specific types of metadata. Um, this metadata also helps storage. Right, uh, tags are a different type of metadata that's attached to an object. Uh, tags are mutable, means they can change over time, and and they can affect all these policies that we see here. They can affect whether someone has access to an object, whether an object should be deleted or not. So basically, the protocol makes it easier to administer the data, um, to make it uh, to make it more secure, and and we're pretty excited about S3, and this is why we actually added support for S3 very very early on. Um, in, in, in the vast uh, roadmap. Now, there's challenges um, uh, with this transition to object. Um, HDFS and S3 are very, very different, uh, with specifically within the context of the analytics world that, that talks a lot about HDFS and is based a lot about HD, on HDFS. Um, and, and the, you know, the open source community delivered um, um, uh, 
um, connectors and ways to bridge this gap without changing applications. One of them is S3A, which is a connector, um, uh, or basically a translation layer between HDFS and S3. Um, and it's very inefficient. And, and one of the things that was um, you know, challenging while enjoyable is that you know, walking this path with Agoda together where we saw um, when things were not performant enough, kept doing comparisons against uh, you know, native HDFS, we identified issues within VAST, we fixed them. We identified issues within the S3A connector, uh, and and the team, the engineering team at Agoda was very proficient and able to to just you know um, uh, forward the code and change it where needed to make it more efficient. Um, and and sometimes we identified things that are um, even impossible to do, like rename, um, uh, where S3A would, when wanted to rename a file, it actually had to copy the entire file and delete the source. So um, so we decided together to extend the S3 protocol um, and, and allow rename, right? And this is not something that S3 has, but VAST S3 has it and Agoda leverages it because it eventually really makes a big effect um, on, on, the, on the amount of hardware you need and the performance of the system because you don't need to copy a file um, just every time you write a file. HDFS, every time it uploads a file, it eventually uh, renames it for atomicity. Um, another another thing about S3 is that it was built for for the web, which means it's based on HTTP, and HTTP is not always um, uh, very fast. You know, it really depends on the request size. It depends on a bunch of parameters, and and NFS is sometimes faster. It's a binary protocol. Uh, it doesn't need to open uh, new connections all the time, where S3 often uh, would need to open new connections for for delivering new requests. Um, and, and what's nice is that we architected the system to support both protocols at the same time. So you can choose to use NFS on the same data if you need the performance or if you have an application that needs a file system uh, interface and not an object interface and you don't want to port it. Um, so how do we enable multi-protocol? Um, S3 objects versus NFS versus files. Um, they're not the same thing. Like we see in the middle that, uh, you know, a get from S3 is similar to an NFS read and an S3 put is similar to a write, but there's, there's also unique features to every one of these uh, protocols. So S3, for example, has listing with a prefix, which means that you need to, to have an ordered list of all the objects. It needs to be ordered. A file system does not require ordering within a directory. Uh, S3 has user metadata that file systems don't. Uh, S3 has identity policies. On the other end, we see that files have be, can be overwritten, where S3 files are immutable, S3 objects. Files can be renamed. Users can, can lock files to have exclusive access. Um, this is, for example, being leveraged by applications like SQLite to allow concurrency from different clients. And, and what's neat about it is that um, from VAS perspective, every file is an object and every object is a, is a file. So you could say we're both a file system and an object storage system, um, and, and we had to, to model all these constraints when we implemented it. We, early on, when we defined what the directory is, we knew we, we would need to support sorting the names within that directory in order to support S3. We knew we were, we were going to need to support um, case insensitive um, um, names within directories to support Windows. So we had to, to take in all of these constraints of the different file and object protocols. Uh, when we implemented this, uh, what we call element store. Um, now, beyond this architecture, we, we, we eventually we work with our users daily. We see you know, where they waste a lot of their time. We see their pain points. We wanted to simplify things um, when it comes to handling storage. So we have an API that users can leverage to, ha to have automation um, that's based on a Swagger interface. We have um, a SaaS product called Uplink, which lets you analyze our clusters from the cloud and have a centrally managed place for multiple clusters. We have uh, a lot of metrics in our UI, in, in our backend that, that users can collect and look at, you know, how many operations am I doing on the cluster? How many different types of operations, what users are doing on the cluster? Um, we analyze uh, the, the, the usage of every single directory uh, on the cluster. So you can actually have this pie chart and, and, and drill down and see what really consumes the data on the cluster um, and understand what VAST is doing on the back end from a data reduction perspective. Like how much one, how much these data, these different types of data compress uh, within VAST. 
Uh, and lastly, we have uh, this data flow um, concept where we can show which clients and which users are active on which types of data and which C nodes. So you could see like the top user that's accessing the top bucket that's taking the most performance um, from the cluster. Okay, so that's storage. Uh, now VAST is called VAST data and not VAST storage for a reason. Uh, early on, we knew that we wanted to climb up the stack uh, and solve more and more pains going, going all the way up to, to the users that care about business. Uh, that care about you know revenue and retention and engagement and all those things and that means that we solved the storage stack and we wanted to climb up to the database and further uh, up to the users so we're coming up um, um, right now we we have uh, uh, the vast natural database we call it mdb for short um, and it's already in alpha stages uh, even at agoda and with and a bunch of other select customers um, and, and it's coming from a very similar pyramid to the one we saw with storage. Uh, we see a trade-off um, within the world of analytics um, and, and, and data platforms. Uh, you see below a data lake, which is usually uh, an object storage or HDFS um, that's you know, scalable, um, but, but not necessarily delivers very high uh, performance or, or not, doesn't necessarily provide high level functionality. It just you know, stores files or objects. On top of that, there is a data warehouse, um, which is a mix. It's scalable, but it, it, it supports various operations and not all of them. It not, doesn't necessarily support transactions or things that you, you'd get from uh, a database. And over at the top, you'll have a database that would be very functional and would have tons of functionality and give, give the users lots of power, but it wouldn't be scalable enough and often runs in a single server. So we wanted to eliminate these trade-offs, we said, you know, we solved the storage problem where we have a very scalable architecture. How can we enable mutation of data? How can we enable transactions? How can we enable, um, um, how can we eliminate this trade off of storing data in files? When we look at, you know, customers trying to optimize for the size of the per K file, whether they should compress or not, um, many of these trade offs and many of these um, uh, existing, you know, protocols that were built upon, they present overhead. Uh, we see those analytics engines running up top like Spark, like Impala, like Trino. When they work on files and objects, they need to open many files and scan them. Uh, and, and there's a lot of overhead to that. So what we did, what we basically did is we built a columnar store, a columnar database. Um, and and you know it's I, I I don't have enough time today and I really wanted to to cover storage, but I'm just going to give you a taste and so we build this columnar database and then one end we want to support very standard API so we have a restful API. Um, a, a Trino connector that leverages a lot of functionality within the cluster delegates a lot of you know predicates and a lot of things are happening faster uh, than a standard Trino over s three um, we're going to support ingesting standard per K files. Uh, through our uh, NFS and F3 interfaces, and eventually we're going to be able to serve um, these standard analytics applications like uh, like Spark um, applications that are going to consume error because we're going to have you know standard plugins um, and really want us to embrace uh, open formats within within that world. Um, lastly, this is how a vast cluster looks like. Um, this cluster actually has two more rows behind it. It's a hundred petabyte cluster to one of our large customers. Um, and the, the Agoda cluster is very similar. And, and basically what you see here is the AJ enclosures are the one that have uh, our logo. Uh, and you can see on the, on the side, there is many slots for all the SSDs. Um, and uh, on the, over at the top, um, there is standard Intel servers uh, with our compute nodes. Um, and, and each one of our customers is able to just add more, uh, more of these D boxes to increase capacity as data grows, or add more C boxes or compute boxes that you see up, that you see on the um, upper upper side uh, to get more performance. Uh, that's it. <laughs>